nothing. Where's my wolf pack at? Where's my wolf pack at? Oh! That's right. Good morning, Discovery Church. I'm so excited to be here today. My name is John Gizzy. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Pastor Tim uh, is not with us this week. He is over in Israel right now doing a uh, educational tour for the pastors in the area. Um, so we've got to keep him in our prayers, as well as Pastor Mike, who is uh, leading a team to the Dominican Republic um, on a mission trip uh, for the, the little village of Barahona. I'm probably not saying it right, Barona, Barahona, but uh, they're, they're over there right now uh, doing the Lord's work. And uh, we just got to remember them in our prayers. So if you just pray with me uh, before we go to the Lord, uh, and then we'll jump right into it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and the opportunity to speak here, speak your word at Discovery Church, Lord. I, uh, I just ask that you continue to be uh, with Pastor Tim and Pastor Mike as they're overseas with different teams, uh, just uh, leading the way, uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that you be with this message today. Uh, let it be your words and not mine that are spoken, Lord. And if anybody here that does not know you personally the way I know you, uh, just rest your Holy Spirit on them today, right now, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to jump right into it. Last week, uh, we heard from Pastor Mike, and he was going about teaching us how to act like a wolf. Before that, we heard from Dr. Tommy Green, and he was teaching us how to speak like a wolf. And then four weeks ago, uh, Mike Baker kicked off the entire series with Think Like a Wolf. Today, we are getting in to the final week, and it is Fight Like a Wolf. We declared war, and we've got to fight now. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to turn into your Bibles, if you have them, and I hope you do, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. The book of Ephesians was written 60 years, uh, 60 AD um, by the Apostle Paul uh, to the church in Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus. Ephesus, it's fun. So the Ephesians who lived in Ephesus got a letter from Paul who was chained to a prison guard in a prison in Rome. <clears throat> Paul wrote a letter of encouragement to his friends in a church in Ephesus where he was chained to a guard in prison in Rome. Paul's a, Paul's a beast. Let me, just, let me just brag on Paul for a second. <clears throat> Paul is one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived, not only for the persecution that he went through and the perseverance that he showed, but Paul could write a sermon about anything. Paul, dude was chained to a prison guard, and he wrote this sermon in Ephesians 6, uh, and we're going to learn about that momentarily. So Ephesians chapter 6, we'll start in verse 10. <clears throat> a final word, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his, and in the mighty power. Put on the, all of the armor of God, and you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the evil times. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Boom. That was great. <clears throat> you got the armor of God. A lot of us have heard that before. Uh, but this is important. We know that we're supposed to fight. But who are we supposed to fight? We need an enemy. You can't just go fight nothing. And we see in Scripture that we have our enemy. We're supposed to put on the armor of God so that we can stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. <clears throat> the devil is a real enemy. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. 
who are fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against the evil spirits in heavenly places. The devil is not a myth. The devil is not a cartoon character, and he's not a scary story that we tell our kids to make them behave. The devil is very real, as real as you and me. The devil's been around since the beginning. <clears throat> the devil's been around since the beginning. He tempted Eve to eat the fruit that God, he says, you can have anything you want except the fruit from this tree. Don't touch it. Well, that wasn't enough. The devil says, oh, yeah, bet you won't die. <clears throat> so he's been around. He's been tempting human beings since the beginning. He was thrown out of heaven because he was, you know, not a good dude. He wanted to be God. You can't be having that. So God sent him here, and he's been going to and from the earth for thousands and thousands of years, messing with people, tripping us up. He knows what the story is. He knows God wins the war, but he's going to take out as many of God's people as he can while he's here and while he has the time. So we have a very real enemy that we cannot see, but we know that he's there. How do we fight the devil? How do we fight our enemy? Well, we need proper tools, we need proper training, and we need a proper team, right? Do you have any veterans here? Anybody served in the military? Praise God. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. All right. When you join the military, they don't just give you a pile of stuff, a pile of tools, guns, uh, armor, things like that, and say, okay, go do something. <clears throat> no. They give you a weapon. They give you armor. They show you how to use it. They train you how to use it. They give you an enemy to go fight, and they give you a team, a unit, a squad, a platoon, whatever, to go and fight with. You go as a team. You go together. You don't do it by yourself. And to fight like a wolf, to fight like a wolf, a wolf fights in a pack, in their family, in a team. If you see a wolf by himself, he's probably sick. He was either <clears throat> too weak to, to beat the alpha and take over the pack, or he's crazy, he's rabid, and they threw him out, but he doesn't have a pack, he doesn't have a family, he's on his own, he's by himself, and those wolves are dangerous, because they don't have anybody, we don't have those things, we are together, we're a family, right here, this is my wolf pack right here, this is my wolf pack, my small group, my discovery group on Thursday night, that's my, that's my wolf pack, all right, it's important that we have a team. It's important that we have tools, and it's important that we know who our enemy is. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will stand firm. Put on every piece. <clears throat> put on every piece. Not put on, here, take your Bible and, you know, just live a normal, a normal medial Christian. No. Put on every piece of armor. You need every piece. There's reasons that that is put in there. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. We're starting off with the belt. That's who puts their belt on first? Oh, you got to put your pants on, right? You got to put your pants on, you put your belt on. Well, when this was written, now remember, Paul's chained, Paul's chained to a prison guard. And he's looking at this soldier, he's looking at this guard, and he's wearing armor, and <clears throat> they used to wear robes back then. Everybody wore robes. I mean, it's the Middle East, it's hot, you want something, you know, that the wind can give you a little, a little breeze every now and then. <laughs> but when you're, <clears throat> when you're wearing a robe, it flows behind you, right? And it's dangerous. If you got to run or fight, you could trip over it, it could snag on something and you get stuck, right? It's not, it's not conducive to the situation. So what they would do is they would gird up their loins, they would take their robe and bring it up and tuck it into their belt. So this way they're, you know, they're almost made like, like Aladdin pants. You know how he's got the little, the big, the big poofy pants, the MC hammer style, and they would come up and they'd tuck it into their belt so they could run and fight and do what they needed to do without getting tripped up, <clears throat> without getting snagged on things that would stop them from doing what they had to do. Like I says, whether it be fighting or running a race, they had to, they had to have this belt. And the belt goes all the way around, right? Some of our belts are bigger than others, but they do the same thing, right? They go around, they hold, they hold you up, they keep, they keep everything where it needs to be. 
it's funny that he starts with the belt and he refers to it as the belt of truth. What is the truth? And how's the truth going to help me live a better life? Well, we see in John chapter 14, Jesus telling his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> we need to be surrounded by the truth. That is Jesus Christ. When we go forward, we need to go forward in truth. If we got to back up a little bit so we don't, we don't stumble, we got to back up in truth. When we juke left and right, we got to do it in truth. The truth that is Jesus Christ and everything we do, do it with Jesus. Very important. The truth will set you free. The truth is a good thing. If you tell the truth all the time, you don't got to remember any lies. You just got to tell the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. But you know what? The truth will set you free. <clears throat> we need to surround ourselves with it. The body armor of God's righteousness. We need to put on the body armor of God's righteousness. Body armor back then was made of leather or metal. And it, would, and it, it covers. Body armor covers your, your vitals. It covers your heart and your lungs, your, your liver, your guts, everything. It covers that. That soldier can't stab you if you got armor here, right? Now we have Kevlar, we have bulletproof vests. You know, if you got you want to protect this, this is an important, this is an important part. This is where everything that counts is, you know. We want to protect that, and we protect it with God's righteousness. Now, what's God's righteousness look like? Is it like thick leather? Is it metal? Is it, is it Kevlar? What is God's righteousness? God's righteousness is the blood of Jesus Christ. He gave us. He, be, who had, he became sin who had no sin to give us his righteousness. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness. That was Christ's exchange for us. Praise God for that. Praise God that Jesus came here and let us kill him so we, he could give us his righteousness so we could be like him. So we could be like Jesus. So we could live with him forever in eternity. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. We need to be covered with God's righteousness. We need to protect our hearts. Guard your hearts. We see that in the Bible a couple times. Guard your heart. I'm going to guard it with the righteousness of God. If I'm living a righteous life, my heart's guarded. I don't have to worry about having lust in my heart or deceit in my heart or greed in my heart. I have righteousness. I have the righteousness of God because it's not from me. Righteousness doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from me or a good sermon you hear or reading your Bible. It comes from Jesus Christ, salvation through Jesus Christ. For shoes, put on the readiness to preach the good news of peace with God. For shoes, put on the readiness to preach the good news of the peace with God. Well, I'm not a preacher. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Okay, well, he doesn't say go be a preacher. He says be ready to preach the good news of peace with God. <clears throat> you don't have to go stand on a pulpit to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't have the, the, the peace that is God. Jesus Christ, you, you don't need that. You just need to be obedient. If you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, if he, the Holy Spirit's living in your heart, that's what you're talking about. If you're thinking about Jesus, you're talking about Jesus. If you're talking about Jesus, you're thinking about him. And if you're thinking about him, you're probably living the right way. Out of a man's heart, out of a man's mouth comes the desires of his heart. We see that. Forty days, Jesus walked this earth after he was killed and he came back. He rose from the dead. He walked 40 days and he left with a message. With There were hundreds of people there, his disciples, uh, the Pharisees, the, the people in the town that saw him. And he says, go. In Matthew chapter 28, he says, go. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey all that I've commanded you to do. And surely I'll be with you forever. That's important. 40 days Jesus walked around after he died. It wasn't enough that the tomb was empty. It wasn't enough that the tomb was empty. He had to walk around and say, hey, look, I told you I was coming back. Look at the holes in my hands. Look, now you see me peekaboo. Oh, I don't got to move my hands because look, that's me. Boom. Touch it. Touch it. Come on, Thomas. Touch it. I know you don't believe me, bro. But I'm telling you right now. 
he did it for a reason. 40 days he stuck around for to tell us this. If that's what he's leaving us with, that's got to be something of importance. That's got to be something super meaningful. Go and make disciples. Okay. Okay, I could do that. I could do that with my brothers and sisters, my parents, my children, my spouse, my neighbors on my street. Who here knows their neighbors on the left or the right? You know your neighbors. That's great. Do you, you know what kind of car they drive? You probably know how many kids they have. Ha, have you shared a meal with them? Do you really know your neighbors? Have they been to your home? Have you guys ate together? Have you talked about Jesus? Do they know you're a believer? Do they know you're a follower of Christ? Or do they just assume it because you got a Discovery Church sticker on the back of your car? Or you have a, you have a Jesus fish symbol on your bumper sticker? <clears throat> or you got a Bible on your dashboard? That you probably haven't opened in a little bit. But you keep it there. So this way when the cops pull you over, they're like, oh, he's a Christian man. We're just going to let him slide. Oh, before Jesus, I had a Bible on my dashboard. Never read it. But, you know, if the cops pulled me over for speeding, I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Mm, I knew. Shame on me. But do they know, do your neighbors know, do your coworkers know that you are a follower of Christ by your actions? Or do they just assume it because you post a quote, a Bible quote? a Bible verse on Facebook every now and then. Or because you take family pictures at Easter at church. Look at us. Mm. My little angels. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to get beat on the way to church. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'd be so bad. Put your shoes on. I'd... Oh, I used, to, I used to catch beatings on the way to church, man. A righteous beating, but we get to church, everybody's all smiles. Jesus left us with the message to preach the good news. We need to share it wherever we go. You don't have to be up here on a pulpit. You just need to do it where you're at. You need to bring the peace that is God. Preach it. Share it. Teach it. If, if, you, if, you, if you don't know where to start, I would suggest starting with the people in your home. If the people in your home are saved, praise the Lord. Start with the neighbors to your left and the right. Then go across the street. Then go down the block. Then, if you've hit everybody on your block, take out your phone and jump on Facebook or Instagram and start scrolling down your messages or in your contacts list. I guarantee everybody knows somebody who doesn't know Jesus. I guarantee it. And if you don't, you need to get some new friends. <laughs> Jesus didn't call Pharisees and theologians and, uh, you know, lawmakers he called regular people he called fishermen and tax collectors and activists and ordinary people like you and me that's who he called when he was walking down the river and he says hey you follow me he wasn't talking to caesar he wasn't talking to the roman generals he was talking to fishermen hey follow me follow me like who are these people you're about to change the world turn it upside down he's just regular people if you're talking about Jesus, that means you're probably thinking about Jesus. Pastor Mike said last week, show me your five closest friends and I'll show you your future. I say, let me look on your text messages and see what you're talking about and I'll know what you're thinking about and what's on your heart. Let me see the stuff you're liking on Facebook and I'll tell you what's on your heart. Verse 16, in addition to all of these, hold up a shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. The shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Hmm. Well, what is faith? Hebrews 11, verse 1 says, faith shows the reality of what is hoped for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see what we hope for and the evidence of things we cannot see. Well, I can't see any fiery arrows. You see, anybody ever here been shot at with fiery arrows before? Not that I can see. What do fiery arrows look like to you and me? Is it temptation to sin? Is it health problems? Is it financial trouble? Is it a bad attitude? Is it road rage? Oh, yeah. Get some fiery arrows sometimes in Port St. Lucie around like 5 30, 6 o'clock. I don't even like being on the road at that time. Oh no, because <clears throat> I know. And somebody's giving me some problems trying to get around me, working me up, and I go look in the rear view mirror to go give them that one finger salute, and I see my 
Discovery Church sticker in my rearview mirror, and I go, mm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for them to lose their license so they can't be out here on the road with me. And <clears throat> it's hard. It's hard. But those are some fiery arrows for me. I started off this year, I went into 2020 so excited. I was ready. I says, this is going to be my year. We're making it happen. 2020, I got 2020 vision. I could see clearly now 2019 is gone. It's been fiery arrow after fiery arrow. I was so excited. I got engaged uh, around Christmas time. I says, we're planning a wedding this year. We're going to buy a house this year. I'm going to get more preaching opportunities this year. My discovery group is going to blow up. I have like 100 people in there this year. We're, gonna, we're, gonna ch- we're, we're building our next chapter this year. We're doing crazy things for the kingdom. It's amazing. I'm so excited. So many people are going to come to know Jesus this year. It's going to be a good year. But for the past 26 days, it's been fiery arrow, fiery arrow, fiery arrow. Every, coming from every direction. And I'm like, what is going on? Can we, February 1st, I'm starting my year over. We're going to start the year. This was a trial month. You get the trial month. It's like Disney Plus. You get a trial month, and then, and then yes, no, no. We're just, we got to have faith. We got to have faith. <clears throat> and it's so easy to look at the problems and focus on the problems instead of focusing on the God that is taking care of us. It's so easy to see the army that's coming at you instead of paying attention and focusing to the God that's standing behind you. It's so easy. But we we need to focus the other way. We need to focus on the shield of faith. We need to have faith. I can't see the shield. I can't see God. Who here has seen God? Okay. I haven't seen God, but I know he's real. And I know that he is with me. I haven't seen oxygen either, but... Yeah, it's there. Okay, we're good. Uh, you know, you don't see which way the wind's coming from or which way it's going, but you know it's there because you could what? You could feel it on your face. You could see things happen. You could see uh, uh, leaves blowing around. You could see the trees moving. You could feel it. You just know. It's just something you know. It's, it's, God is real. I've seen troubles for the past 26 days, but I've seen solutions. Not the solutions I had. Not the solutions I had at all but the solutions God put there. It's amazing how God works. Health problems. Got health problems. It's so easy to say, oh, it's over for me. Or it's so easy to say, oh, the doctor can't fix it. Or no, how about pray about it? Like pray with expectancy. How about say, I believe that God has a great plan for me. I believe that he wants to use me to further his kingdom. So I'm going to pray that God's going to heal me and use whatever sickness I have, whatever problems I have to advance his kingdom. It's easy to say, but do we believe it in here? We have a lot of faith in things. We have a lot of faith in our job and our personal skills and our education that we have. And uh, we have a lot of faith in doctors and we have a lot of faith in all these things that are of the world. But are we putting our faith in those things or are we putting our faith, faith in Christ and Christ alone? Some of us are still holding on to things when we, when we pray and we give our lives to Christ and we say, I give you, I give you this, Lord. I give you this. Take control of it. Except this. I'm going to hang on to this. I have faith that this stage ain't going to fall out from under me. It's so easy to put your hand on something and not give it fully to God. Say, here, I'm going to give you my finances, Lord. I'm going to give you my health. I'm going to give you my children. But I'm still going to hang on. Oh, no. That's not what he wants. That's not what he, God requires. God requires to have faith, blind faith, like how you can't see that shield of faith. That's what we got to have. We got to trust that the arrows ain't going to get us because we got Jesus. Verse 17, put on the salvation as your helmet. Salvation as your helmet. Why? Why salvation as the helmet? Well, what is salvation? Salvation is being saved from what? The blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus came here. He died. He rose again. And he went back to heaven. And he says, I'm coming back for you. Love God. Love each other. Make disciples. Boom. These guys gave you ten commandments. I'm going to give you two. And all the other ones will fall under these. Just love God. 
with everything you got and love each other. Love your wolf pack. Make disciples. Bring more wolves into the pack. We're better together, right? We're better together. It's hard doing life alone. I got my Thursday night discovery group. I love discovery group Thursday night. It's like my favorite night of the week. We have church on Sunday, and then we have, you know, impact on Wednesday. But my my discovery group on Thursday night is, is the best for me because I get down with my family. Not my blood family, but my church family, my wolf pack. We pray together. We study the Bible together. We share meals together. We talk about our highs and our lows of the week, and we pray for each other and with each other. It's super important that we do this. We have, we have seven-year-olds and 57-year-olds and everything in between in our small group. We got little Camden. Camden is the man. Camden will, can't we, highs and lows for the week. Camden gets in it. He shares his highs and lows. He asks questions. He answers questions when we're doing our Bible study. It's amazing watching this young man growing in the Lord. He just got baptized last year, gave his life to Christ, and now he's walking with the Lord. He's reading his Bible. He's praying. He's setting a good example in the school. It's a beautiful thing. His whole family, it's amazing. The helmet of salvation protects our head. What's in our head? Our brain, right? And what, what, what controls our brain? Our mind, right? And we want to be in sound mind. We want to be in sound mind. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. John 15, 7. What's that? That's thinking about Jesus. That's praying to Jesus, knowing we can pray to him and ask him these things because he's the one that saved us. He's the one that saved us. Ephesians six seventeen continues, we put on the salvation as your helmet and take on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Bam. Don't look sharp. You can shave with this, maybe, No. This is a powerful tool that we have, this Bible. It's not, for, it's not a sword for hurting non-believers. You know, we're Bible thumpers. You don't go hitting non-believers on the head. You sinner, bam, you sinner. No, <clears throat> this is love. This is God's word of love. But to the enemy, to the devil, this is a sword. You know why? Because it's the truth of God. He don't want us reading this. God don't want us reading this. How many of us have a Bible sitting on our coffee table with dust on it? Or sitting on our bedside table with, with a cup on top of it, a cup of water, or another book? How many of us have not have a Bible app that we haven't looked in in a while, but we'll like something on Facebook? Boom, that's, that's my Bible for the day. <clears throat> this is the word of God. This is the most powerful tool we have. That's the cheat sheet right there. When we were in school and the teacher would give us like an open book test, that was the best. It's like cheating, but not cheating. You got the answers right there. The smartest kids in class that knew they were getting 100. If there was an open book test, they'd be the first ones to open their book up because they ain't stupid. So that's where the answers are. I'm going to double check. I'm going to double check my answers. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Some of the students will ask me a, a question about the Bible, and I'll instead of just blurting something out, I'll say, hey, let's see what the Bible says about it. I don't want to look like an idiot and misquote it and not say something right. We look in the Bible. We say, let's see what the Bible says about it. The answers are here. The answers are here. And for fighting the devil, this is our sword. When Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil was tempting him with bread and jump off this, and then he was quoting scripture at him. He was quoting scripture at him. That amazing. Ooh, you look hungry. Ooh, turn those rocks into bread. You won't. You won't. That's right. Because man don't live on bread alone. Boom. What? What? He just hit him with words? Just words. It's the word of God. The word of God, the same word of God that we have here today is the same word of God that said, let there be light, and bam, there was light, <clears throat> and it was good. The same word of light. It's the same words that made all the creatures of the field and the birds of the sky, including the wolves. And God said what? It was good. The same words that made you and me. And God said, it is good. 
That's powerful that God could just speak something into existence. It's hard for us because we, like, we have little finite human minds that we can't do, but we need to protect our mind with salvation by putting on the helmet. And we have to have the sword. It's not just to protect us. We have the belt of truth to hold, to hold us together and we're surrounded by truth. The truth's holding us. We have the, the breastplate of righteousness, the armor of righteousness uh, to protect us. We have the shield of faith to protect us from the arrows and the helmet. We got to go on the offensive. It's a battle. It's a battle. It's not a hang out until reinforcements come. Jesus ain't the reinforcements. Jesus is the alpha dog. He is the pack leader. He's the general leading the charge. We got to fight back. We're in a battle. When we walk out here today, this is not your battlefield. That's your battlefield. It's not a play field. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. This is, this is our rally. This is our rally cry we do when we raise a hallelujah, when we sing to Jesus. That's our, this is our getting ready for battle. We go do it out there. Sunday morning ain't enough. Discovery group ain't enough. We got to be living it. We got to be walking the walk. The Bible is so important. I can't, I can't stress that enough that we need to be in it. When we pray, when we pray and we make our wish list to God, when we write our Christmas list to, to Santa Jesus, I'm guilty. God, fix this. God, help me with this. Get me out of. God, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Things, things that don't matter. I want to. I want to know God. I don't want to know what he could do for me. I want to know him. I want to know why he did all this. Why me? Why he chose me? Who am I? I'm like the worst. Without Jesus, I'm the worst. Ask somebody that knew me back then. They'd be like, oh, he's the worst. Liver worst. Ugh. Thick cut. <laughs> it's so important that when we pray to God, we pray with our Bibles open. This is our sword. When we pray, we pray for battle. When Jesus died on the cross, that wasn't the battle. That wasn't the battle. When Jesus was in the garden the night before, on his knees, sweating blood, praying out, crying out to God, saying, if, if there's another way, let it be, but if there's not, I'm going to do it anyway. Praying for his disciples that were there in the garden with him that were sleeping on the job, by the way. He asked them to come pray with him. They were sleeping. He was praying for him. He says, I pray not only for these, but for those who will come to know me through their message. Boom. That's you and me. If it wasn't for the obedient disciples, we would not be here today. Jesus won the battle in prayer. So who's on my team? Who are we fighting with? Who are we fighting side by side with? That's us, guys. This is our wolf pack. Wolves don't fight alone. A wolf by himself is a sick wolf. And he won't survive. We got to do it together. We got to do it together. We have to do it together. Jesus says, love each other. I love you guys. I love you guys. I hope you love me too. Because Jesus requires that. I want nothing more than to see everybody win. I want to see everybody in heaven with me someday. Unfortunately, that's not how it is. But that's on us. We're at war. And you can't remain neutral. Joshua says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today who you will serve. Would you prefer to serve the gods of your ancestors that you served over the Euphrates? Or would it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live in today? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a cute Bible verse, all right, that we, a lot of us have over the archway of our house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Praise God, serve the Lord. But before you can serve the Lord, you got to choose today who will you serve you got to pick a side. Because if you're standing in a neutral zone, you're in the crosshairs. And that's a dangerous place. The best place to stand is not even to stand. It's to kneel before God with your sword. A soldier always has a sword with him. Always at the ready. I want to ask everybody if they just join you right now and take a knee. If you're able. Home, and you're praying in your prayer closet or your private area, whether it be in your living room or your bedroom, 
wherever it is, quietly get alone with God with your Bible. Cry out to Jesus. And then get quiet and listen. You can't have a conversation if you're not listening to the other party. This is the Word of God. I don't know what your needs are or your wants or what you're struggling with this week. What kind of fiery arrows the devil is shooting at you this week. But I'm going to pray and I, I just want you to pray in the privacy of your own heart. And cry out to Jesus in faith. Cry out expecting an answer. Cry out begging. Begging God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to bring your truth today. Thank you for every single one of my brothers and sisters here today that are in my wolf pack. Lord, thank you for this community, this family. Thank you for your word and the armor that you've given me to protect myself from the enemy. And your word, the sword that you've given me to help me fight my enemy. Heavenly Father, I just ask right now if there is just one person here today or listening to my voice right now that does not know you, that is alone, walking around without a pack, without a family, that you just touch their heart right now in Jesus' name. That you just let them know that you want them. You want them as members of the pack. You want them. If you don't know who Jesus is, cry out to him right now. It doesn't cost anything. You just need to raise your voice and ask him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us and raising again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.